This is Gordotech. Making and using agar. I created this video because it's really the only thing I didn't cover in my bulk mushroom grow video where I showed how to go from spores to finished dried powdered mushrooms and capsules. If you want to see that video, by the way, it's available for free on my Patreon page. I have to keep all my controversial content on the Patreon page only to avoid triggering the censors here at YouTube who have a history of deleting content creators like myself. The revolution will not be televised. You can follow me on Patreon for free and all content there is available to everyone. You do not have to support the channel to gain access, although your support is always appreciated. As an incentive for following me on Patreon, I am also giving away a valuable spore print for free to anyone that requests one from me by private message message on Patreon. These spore prints are not sold anywhere and it is for what I consider to be the best strain of a species that is the crown jewel of all mushrooms. I've already sent these prints all over the world to more than 20 different countries and the feedback I've received so far has been phenomenal. I'm pointing this out now because my next video will cover how to grow this particular mushroom and that video will go direct to Patreon only. It will not be on YouTube. I will also be doing some videos on cacti and mescaline extraction and those will also not be on YouTube. I am even going to do videos about thin layer chromatography but I'm not sure if YouTube will ban those too. Besides Patreon, you can follow me on social media to get alerts about new content as well. I don't post often but will announce all new content there. I'll put links to that in the video description. So back on topic, we need to talk about agar. In this video, I will show you how to make your own. It is possible to buy pre-poured dishes, but when you look at the reviews, these are often not sterile and just a waste of time and money. You should learn to make your own. You can, however, save a little bit of time by getting pre-mixed malt extract agar, where all you have to do is add hot water, but you get the most bang for your buck just mixing it yourself. I'll put a link to that as well as everything else used in this video in the description. Let's start by taking a quick look at the three recipes I will be making in this video. You can take a screenshot or picture of this if you want to print it or reference it later. The most popular agar recipe is light malt extract agar, or LMEA. It works well with most species of mushrooms, and this is the one I recommend. To make one 16 ounce jar of agar, which can be used to pour dozens of plates, you will need 8 grams of light malt extract, 8 grams of agar powder, and 400 milliliters of hot water. If you bought a pre-mixed malt extract agar powder, you would just combine that with hot water alone. The next recipe is for black agar. It is pretty much the same as the last recipe with the addition of two tablespoons of carbon powder. I do not recommend black agar, but I made it here just for demonstration purposes and because some people prefer it. And the final recipe is potato dexterous agar. I demonstrate this one mostly because it's the go-to recipe for someone that doesn't want to order anything online. You can often find all of the ingredients at your local supermarket. You will need one medium-sized potato. It can be a regular potato, an orange sweet potato, or a purple potato. I will make it using two different types of potatoes just to show that both work fine. For the dextrose, you can simply use any pure honey product. All right, it's time to get started. Boil a quart of water for each jar of agar you will be making. I'm going to show you four different recipes for making nutrient agar. I'll put links to everything in the video description. Gather all of the materials you'll be using for whichever type of agar you decide to make. The most common type of agar used for mycology and the version I recommend is light malt extract agar or LMEA, sometimes just called MEA. The recommended malt extract shown here is very inexpensive and can produce hundreds of plates worth of agar. You will of course need some agar agar, which you can buy online or find at most Asian grocery stores. Two ounces is really all you need. You can also buy it pre-powdered. I will be using honey only for the potato dextrose agar recipe. If you will be making potato dextrose agar, or PDA, then you will need one medium-sized potato. Any type will be fine. Regular or sweet potato or even a purple potato will work. To make black agar, you will need some activated carbon. I did this just because black agar was once pretty popular in the mycology hobby, but personally I think it's kind of silly and I would not recommend it. If you're going with the potato recipe, I recommend just dicing up the potato into cubes. About a centimeter per cube is fine. It doesn't have to be exact though. And there's no reason to remove the skin first. 
For this recipe, you're looking for approximately 80 grams of potato. We will dump the potato cubes into a pot, then just add enough water to cover the potatoes. Move this to the stove and let it boil on high heat. Once it starts boiling, you can turn the heat down a little and let it simmer. Set a timer for 30 minutes. While that's boiling, we'll do the same preparation with the purple potato. I just did this to compare to see if there was any difference, any advantage or disadvantage to using different types of potato. So once again, we are looking for about 80 grams of potato. So we'll just dice that all up and lay it out one more time to get exactly 80 grams. Add the 80 grams of potato cubes to some hot water. As an experiment for this one, I'm going to try doing the cooking in a microwave oven instead of on the stove top. I set the time to 30 minutes, but power level to five, which means it will only actually be heating for half the time as it will cycle between heating and not heating every 15 seconds. The idea is to try to prevent the water from boiling over and making a big mess. The water levels were looking a little low, so I added a bit more water to the boiling sweet potatoes. This is boiling nicely now, so I'm just going to turn down the heat and then cover this. Now let's focus on the agar, which is interestingly a seaweed derived product. You can buy this in already powdered form, but it's usually sold in grocery stores in long strands like this. You can blend it up to make a powder that it's easier to measure out and work with. Or you could even use a knife or scissors to cut it into smaller pieces to work with. To make it easier to weigh, I'm using a knife to cut the agar up. and I'm going to make 35 grams of powder, so I weigh it out just before blending it down. So let's put it all into the blender now. Here it is being blended down. This can be a little tricky. You may have to stop and start it a few times and push everything down to the bottom or stir it, but you can see that eventually it does blend down to a powder. So for now, we'll just pour that into a Ziploc bag labeled agar. If you're going to make black agar, which I don't actually recommend, you can blend down some activated carbon. I'll put a link to the item in the video description, but you can find it in pet supply stores with the aquarium supplies. It's usually in pellets, but we needed it in powder form, so that's why I'm blending it down here. I put some plastic wrap over the top because this is going to make a fine dust cloud. True story, something interesting happened while blending this down. It actually explodes, sending some of the powder shooting out of the blender. One more reason not to make black agar, I guess. But this didn't seem to cause any real problems or damage. These Blendtec blenders can create a lot of heat and friction and static electricity. Plastic wrap probably didn't help. Alright, so now I'm just going to pour this powder back into the original container that it came in. I put a funnel with a strainer over a glass jar and then cheesecloth on top of that so that when the sweet potato boil is done, we can filter out the potato part. We will only be using the nutrient-rich water that remains. The cheesecloth allows us to squeeze any remaining liquids out of the solid potato mass. You can see on the left I've prepared four jars, each with eight grams of agar powder in them. For each of the potato water-based recipes, I will use honey to provide the dextrose. You can use any type of pure honey. I was trying for 9 grams of honey, but if you go over by a gram or two, it really doesn't matter. You can just put your hot potato water on the scale, hit tear, and then slowly add your honey until it gets to 9 grams. Since this recipe is for 400 milliliters of finished agar, you can add hot water as needed to bring it up to the 400 milliliter line if you are short. Stir this up until the honey is completely dissolved. Then pour the mixture into one of the jars containing 8 grams of agar powder. Put the lid on tight and swirl it around until the agar is dissolved. You can also shake it. We'll just repeat all these steps for the purple potato that we microwaved earlier. Everything is the same, so I'll fast forward through most of this footage.
I will add hot water here just to bring it up to the 400 milliliter mark so that we have the 400 milliliters of agar when we're done. Add the 9 grams of honey and stir it all up. Then pour it into one of the jars with 8 grams of agar powder. Now for the recommended LME agar. Weigh out 8 grams of light malt extract, also known as LME. Then pour that into one of the jars containing 8 grams of agar powder. We'll repeat all of this for our black LME agar recipe. Then add 400 milliliters of hot water to each jar and shake to dissolve everything. For the black agar recipe, we'll add two level tablespoons of the powdered carbon that we blended up earlier. Stir this up thoroughly with a spoon before we put the lid on. Give them all a good shake before we put them into the pressure cooker. I want to note that some people like to put the mason jar lids on upside down to prevent them from sealing tight in the pressure cooker. This will make them easier to open after cooling. Make sure you add at least enough water to come up to the bottom part of the jars. Make sure you loosen all of the rings as pressure will build up and you want these to be able to vent slightly. Some people will even put the lids on upside down to prevent them from sealing which makes it easier to open after the pressure cooking is done. Follow the directions that came with your pressure cooker. If you have a wobble weight design like the one shown, when it starts to wobble, turn your heat down, then set a timer for 30 minutes. After the pressure cooking, let things cool down for at least 30 minutes. If you have a laser thermometer, you're basically just looking for a temperature that allows you to handle the jars without them being too hot. You want to keep the agar inside of a still air box or in front of a flow hood. Wear nitrile gloves and spray them down with 70% isopropyl alcohol. Swirl or shake each jar as you take it out just to ensure that all the contents are thoroughly mixed. If the jars were still not cool enough yet, let them sit a little longer. If using a flow hood, try to operate more towards the center of the flow. I use an elevated glass platform and make sure that it's clean and sanitized. Standard cheap petri dishes cannot be pressure cooked. More expensive dishes, including glass ones, can be cleaned and sterilized. However, they can be difficult to clean and most people prefer to use the cheap disposable ones. Also note that hardcore scientists will usually use Erlenmeyer flasks for pouring agar, which is a little easier and less likely to spill. The smaller opening also gives less chances for contaminants to enter. But mason jars are cheap and ubiquitous and not really hard to pour from in my opinion. You can always do some practice pours to work on your technique of pouring without spilling. Okay, so I'll create a few dishes from each type of agar that we made, starting with the sweet potato honey agar. You can start with the bottom plate first and work your way up to avoid having to lift dishes with agar in them already. You want to pour quickly and only need enough to cover the bottom of the dish. Don't fill them up all the way with agar. If there's a little spot that didn't get agar, it's fine. You can just swirl the plates later and it'll completely cover the bottom of the dish. I'll label some of the dishes so that we can remember which type of agar is in it. And then I'll store them two dishes a piece in Ziploc storage bags. A lot of people use parafilm tape around the petri dish, but it's easier to use clean new Ziploc bags which work well, come sterile, and allow for some air exchange which is required for the cultures. I'll fast forward through the rest of the pouring since it's all the same. Here is the purple potato honey agar. Note that sometimes the lids can be hard to unseal. It's actually better to put them on upside down so that they don't seal in the pressure cooker. But if you have trouble opening one, you can just use a can opener to do it. Here's our light malt extract agar.
And finally our light malt extract agar with carbon added. So we have black agar. Now I'm going to show you how to make an inoculation loop. You can always buy one, but I found this three pack of steel wire at the dollar store and it's enough wire to make a lifetime supply of inoculating loops. You can also use a bare metal paper clip as an alternative. So simply cut off a piece of this steel wire. It should be about 15 centimeters or six inches. Make a loop on one end, then wrap the wire around itself several times as shown. So you have a circle that holds its shape on one end. You can use needle nose pliers to make the loop more circular and to finish wrapping the wire tightly around itself. Then fold the bottom of the wire back up and twist it to make a handle. That's all there is to it. So I'll make a bunch of these so we have backups. And these can all go into a pressure cooker to be sterilized. You can put these in foil along with maybe an X-Acto knife and sterilize that in your pressure cooker. After the pressure builds up, set a timer for 30 minutes. Now back in front of the flow hood, it's time to transfer some spores to the agar dishes. You will need a sterile knife and an inoculating loop to do this. Wear nitrile gloves and spray them down with 70% isopropyl alcohol. We'll also sanitize our working surface and then take out our tools, which will be an X-Acto knife, a spore print, and our inoculating loop. Only open up your spore print in front of a flow hood or in a still air box. The spores will be stuck to whatever surface they came on, so the first thing you should do is scrape them with your sterile knife to loosen them up. Do this carefully and try to make a neat pile of spores. Even a very light print like this one can contain hundreds of thousands of spores and you should be able to create a visible pile of loosened spores from it. Next take out your inoculating loop and flame sterilize it until it glows orange. I prefer using these blue flame lighters. I'll put a link in the video description. But you can get away with using virtually any flame. After you are done flame sterilizing your inoculating loop, Take out a petri dish and briefly dip the hot metal loop into the agar. This will coat the loop with agar and help the spores to stick to it. Immediately after that, dip the loop into your pile of spores. Then swipe the very center of the petri dish with the loop in an S or Z pattern, like you are writing the letter on the surface of the agar. It's important to stay in the middle of the plate because the mycelium will grow out from the center and you will typically only use growth from the outer ring and before it reaches the edge of the plate. The reason for this is that the outermost growth tends to be the most vigorous and healthy with some strain isolation, even on the first plate. After swiping the dish, you want to dip the loop back into your spores for the next swipe. You do not have to flame sterilize between every plate. Here's a close-up of the S-shaped swipe in the middle of the plate. Now it's time to just bag these up and don't forget to label them. You should clean and re-sterilize your loop between different batches of plates. I will zoom through this footage because we will just repeat everything for each type of agar that we prepared. Here is the black light malt extract agar. We will repeat all of these steps until all of our plates are inoculated. Once again, we dip the red hot loop into the agar to coat it, dip it into the spores, and then swipe an S or a Z pattern onto the surface of the agar at the center of the plate. Then we bag it up. It is useful to have a bunch of inoculating loops if you're doing many plates, so you can start with a totally new sterile one instead of reusing the same one too many times. You will want to store these at a temperature between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit for most species. If your house is too cold, an easy way to do this is to take two totes, fill one with warm water, and add an aquarium heater to the water. 
Then put the other tote inside the one with the water. The aquarium heater can be adjusted so that you get just the right temperature inside the upper tote. But if your room temperatures are above 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 Celsius, you really don't need to do anything special. No supplemental heating is required. However, you will often see the fastest growth around 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 26.7 Celsius. Store the plates with the agar layer on top. This reduces the chance for condensation to drop down onto the agar surface, which could disturb or possibly even contaminate the growing mycelium. After a few days of incubation, you can check your plates. Usually the spores will germinate within three to seven days. If the spores are older or the agar is on the dry side, it can take longer, however. It could take as long as four weeks. Here's the growth on the purple potato plate after just three days. Here's the light malt extract plate, which has even more growth on it. Ironically, with the black agar, it seems a little bit more difficult to see the growth, but there does appear to be a little. Here's what the plates look like five days after inoculation. This is the sweet potato honey agar plate, and you can see the growth looks pretty good. Here's the light malt extract plate, and you can see the growth looks even better. This type of agar had the best results, and that's why I normally only use light malt extract agar. One advantage to using clear agar is that you can look at the mycelial growth from both sides of the plate. You can also shine a light from behind it for better visibility. Some people like to dye their agar various colors, but I'm not a fan of that. I don't have any problems with visibility, as you can see. And sometimes contamination might be the same color as your dye, which might cause you to miss it. Here is the purple potato honey agar. You can see some secondary colonization in the plate on the right. This can happen occasionally. It's often from yeast. I would not use a plate like that one, but this is the reason that you make several plates. I will only use the best looking plate with the best growth. But the second plate with this type of agar seems fine, so it could be used. And finally, here's the light malt extract with carbon added or the black agar. And this one has a lot of moisture, so I'm just going to open it up for you. And you can see there's decent mycelial growth there. You can see a little bit of growth near the edge of the plate, which is not good. I probably spilled some spores there. I still prefer the light malt extract agar dish, though, and that's the one I will be using to put to grain. So let's talk briefly about where you would take cuts from this dish to transfer to grain. You're looking for healthy looking, vigorous growth near the outer edge. Normally you would want to wait until the mycelium is about a centimeter from the edge of the plate. This gives it time to self-isolate a bit and allow the most vigorous strains in the dish to prove themselves and make it to the outer edge first. Now many people will take a cutting and put it onto a new agar dish and let it grow out again. This further isolates one strain and you can keep doing that until you are satisfied. But honestly I think this practice is somewhat overrated. You can get some strain isolation even from a single dish and doing these transfers slows down your total grow time and each transfer could potentially introduce contamination as well. I don't find that additional strain isolation makes much difference in the final yield or time to harvest based on experience. I'm also not a fan of keeping cultures around for long time periods. This just wastes space in a refrigerator and the mycelium tends to lose vigor over time. In my opinion, it's better to just make spore prints from your best specimens and more likely than not, the mushrooms you grow from those prints will be very similar to the parent they came from. Spores are the ultimate long-term storage solution because they can remain viable for years, even a decade at room temperature and they take up almost no space space. So getting back to where you should take cuts from a plate like this one, you might think this area is showing the most vigorous thick growth. However, notice that it is not moving as rapidly towards the edge of the plate as other areas of growth, so it's probably not the best candidate. I would say the best locations to take cuttings from are here, here, and here. It's worth mentioning that different species are going to look differently growing on agar. Pennyolus cyanosins is kind of wispy and cottony like this, but other species can get nicely segmented, especially when isolated. Here are a few pictures of contamination just to show you how to identify it, but it's usually very obvious. Anything that is a color other than white is contamination. Some molds will start off white, then change colors as they mature. 
I would recommend you just dispose of any contaminated dishes immediately and don't try to take cuttings from those dishes, although you can sometimes get away with that. All right, I hope you learned something about making and using agar and you are eager to try it out for yourself. There is no need to be intimidated by any of this, and being able to work with agar will allow you to easily grow any species of mushroom. Don't forget to follow me on Patreon and get your free spore print. My next video will not be on YouTube. Alright, stay strong, be kind, and help someone. Love you guys.